at the feet of Jesus for the past few weeks. I have been in, uh, well, except for one time, I went to Matthew one time, but most of the time in the book of Mark. And at the feet of Jesus, story after story, um, just, and I say in this, in just these, these five chapters, because uh, that's where we're at. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 5. I'm going to be starting at verse 21 with uh, the feet of Jesus. And uh, in my, in my uh, scriptures, well, as I have noticed, going up to these scriptures in uh, verse 21, is that at the feet of Jesus, you have lives that realize the power and the care of the Savior. I mean, chapter 1, you have the calling of the disciples coming in that close proximity of the Savior just by the call, uh, Matthew, put away your tax box and come and follow me. Peter uh, and Andrew, uh, put away your fishing nets and follow me. James and John, leave your dad with the others in the, in the boat of fishing and come and follow me, that close proximity. And then there, in just with Mark, it's just this, this quickness of what we find out that takes place at the feet of Jesus or in close proximity to Jesus, such as Peter. And by a, a mere call to quit fishing and follow him, we have one where he finds out very quickly has the power to heal is in the healing of his mother-in-law only found in chapter one. And then you have others where they were uh, demon possessed and uh, G Jesus comes in and heals them. And everyone finds, in fact, those demons, some of them are almost bowing at the feet of Jesus, recognizing you are the most holy one, the most on high. And uh, there's so much that takes place in these chapters leading up to, especially these, this uh, picture and picture story of how things take place when you come in the presence of the Savior. And like I said, picture in picture, because today we have a story where there's a story within the story that has almost nothing to do with the story, but yet it does. And it's a picture in picture. I've never, I've seen it. Do you guys remember that little function of the television? I've always seen it where you, you could be watching this big thing and over here is a tiny little thing. So you can watch two shows at the same time. And in my head, when I saw that, I'm like, why would I want a little one? Now I understand because you know what takes place is, and, and actually I have to come into the 21st century along with the people I'm about to talk about. Um, I always complained to Connie and my family, if you ever want something done right on a computer, stop looking at your phone. That screen is too little. <laughs> I need the big one. <laughs> but picture in picture is what I'm calling a little bit of it today with these two stories. For me, in Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 21, I have a huge headline, and I, I, I liked it. In my Bible, the huge headline says this, Jesus heals in response to faith. And this is one of the things that we're going to see in these uh, verses here. Bear with me as we read along together. Verse 21, Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake. If you were here last week, remember that story where there was the pigs and there was the man who had uh, approximately 2,000 evil spirits in them. And because I know that because they all went into the approximately 2,000 pigs that Mark accounts for. And the man was healed from that, the, the, the legion of many evil spirits. But in that miraculous healing of seeing the authority and the power of the Savior, there were still some that really um, wanted him to be far away from them. Leave us alone. Real people. Not the one demon-possessed, but real people. And I know there's a whole lot of proximity that goes with it, but we have to have this understanding, too, that, you know what, there are people that come close to the Savior and people that really want the Savior to be far from them. And so in this case, they tell him to leave in verse chapter 4, and in verse chapter 5, he does. In the boat, back to the other side of the lake, 
now get this, where there's a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. I'm telling you what. Just in these quick chapters. The, can I say the fame? The fame. And by fame, I don't mean like Hollywood. I mean, do you know what has taken place when you come in proximity of this man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth? This man who is a carpenter's son. When you come close to him, do you see what happens? And so the word of mouth spread so fast and so as he's even come to the other side the crowd is there to kind of come up upon the savior verse 22 then a leader of the local synagogue whose name was Jairus arrived when he saw Jesus he fell at his feet pleading fervently with him my little daughter is dying he said please come and lay your hands on her Heal her so she can live. I'm going to pause throughout this story. You have a crowd that is there. You have a man who comes and, and falls at the feet of the Savior. I, I'm going to say just fervently, and all I can think of is just like a shake, begging the Savior to come, lay hands on my daughter, so you can heal her. I'm gonna, and, and I pause here for a moment because we did it just last week with bro Brother Peter. You know what? I believe sometimes people have forgotten. They think, you know what? Only the Savior comes and lays hands on individuals. But if you read in Scripture, you'll find out that... Well, let me go, just go this route. The Savior who lays hands on people to heal them and raise them up is the same Savior that gives you His Holy Spirit to do even greater things, is what He had said, Jesus, to do the things and carry on, which is why in church, especially this church, I do not have a problem with people who are especially filled with the Holy Spirit and know that God answers prayer, hears prayer, and is at work in prayer and will come and lay hands on an individual. There's no magic with it. All it is is with the divine Holy Spirit sent from the Savior, God the Father, laying on hands. Just so we have an understanding. Why does the church do that? You can heal her and she can live. Verse 24. Jesus went with him and the people followed, crowding around him. And may I say it this way? They were a large crowd pressing up against him kind of make it a constricting thing. And, and the only way I can see it is like a huge crowd. You ever try to move, maneuver through a crowd? It, it, it sometimes, especially if you don't have the, the, the bulk <laughs> to move through a crowd, you can kind of come, come up against a, a wall of, of people and not get through. Unless you've got a bunch of big people, then you can get through. Or if you're small and you can't get through, find those big, big people and you can get through a crowd. But it is very hard when the crowd is doing one thing. They had one agenda, and that was to get to one man, the Savior, which would make that a very difficult thing of walking. Yet Jesus goes with the man as the crowd is going with him. Verse 25. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus. Pause. When I tell you, it is all about telling the story, telling the story of who you know. These people know what the Savior can do. And so, the reason she is not is there, the reason she came is not to just be in the crowd. Woo, man, I'm in the, I'm in the crowd of Jesus. I'm in the crowd of Jesus. Look at me. I went to the concert and I got my ticket. Woohoo! I got proof I was there. No, she had a, a purpose. And that purpose was just like Jarius. Jarius wanted to get Jesus to go home to heal his daughter. Lay hands on her. This woman who's, who's had this illness for 12 years and it kept getting worse and worse, with that, she decided with a purpose she was going to go and be at the Savior in his presence and get healed herself. Spent all the money she had 
and got worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. We as a people falling at the feet of Jesus. If we would have that kind of desire to have God at work within our lives, that we would say within ourselves, and, and then you could place whatever it is that you have. And I don't mean illnesses, but you could throw those in there. But whatever you have within your, in your heart, in your spirit, of how you know God is wanting to um, lead and direct you, whatever it is, if you would have that mentality of, if I could just be at the feet of Jesus, in his presence, and, and not even have a hand laid on me. See, the, the earlier part was lay hands on. Not even have a hand laid on me. Not even me touch his hand or me touch his feet at his feet. But just to touch the clothing of the Savior, I will be healed. If we had the mentality of a people going, if I could just always be in the presence of the Lord, so close I'm touching his garment, what will happen? I will be healed. What will happen? This will be done within my life. I know God has this for me. This is what God wants with me. I know it. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, if I diss him on his garment, touching it. Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Amen. Praise the Lord. Woo! That would be awesome. To, to know, I think if I do this, and I come into this presence, I made my way to him, I did exactly what I thought, I touched his garment, and I not only know, but I feel it through my entire body, it is gone. Jesus realized, I'm at verse 30, Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched me? This is the funniest part of, of the story for me. Because <laughs> I told you how the crowd was. A constricting crowd. And all I can see is like this, you know, trying to make his way to Jared. Because you've got to remember the first part of the story. we got to go to Jairus' house. I'm at the shore, and i got to go to Jairus' house. And so I'm trying to make my way, and then all of a sudden this woman touches me. Stop. Okay, who did it? Who touched me? And I love the response of the disciples found in what, verse, verse 31. The disciples, I want to do it. The, the pastor, are you crazy, Jesus? What do you mean? Look around. It is a massive crowd, and you're asking the question, who touched me? That's me saying it. Because it says, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask? Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Nobody, this is, I, I don't know about you guys, you got, you got to take how Pastor Brent reads stories. Because things pop in my head with these stories. This right here would be one thing. Nobody likes to get in trouble. If you like to get in trouble, go ahead and raise your hand. Because when something is done, and there's always this, this it's always followed with a question. The who done it question. And when there's a who done it question, you're like, uh, no, I don't, I don't want to get in trouble with this one. Now, <laughs> we had the announcement. Thanksgiving dinner is in, what, three Sundays? Something like that. I don't, I don't even know how to count. All right, November 17th, I do know that. November 17th, um, as he calls out for brownies, man, I'm calling out for pumpkin whatever, pie and <laughs> pumpkin lush, anything with Cool Whip. Let me put it that way, anything with Cool Whip, just bring it on. Brother Bud, I will eat a brownie with Cool Whip. No problem. It is the holidays, and it's coming. And now, there's uh, Michelle, God bless Michelle. You know what, she, she teaches the kids downstairs um, some really cool stuff. Uh, they're learning about Esau and Jacob and, and, and how bad brothers can be sometimes. They're, and, but she is one that loves Christmas. Um, yesterday, um, I'm, I'm up early and I'm doing a bunch of stuff for church very early. And 
some kid comes out of the bed, out of, I think it was Sophie or somebody, someone was laying on the couch or something, and they come on, time to go to Home Depot. And I'm like, Home Depot? Oh, man, it's the first sun, Saturday of the month, and Home Depot, they do crafts for free for kids. And, and we got some kids that love doing free crafts, so it's time to get up and go to Home Depot. And so on the way to Home Depot, it gets, even before we go, we're getting ready to get in the car, and there's boom. It was thunder. And the kids come running out. Of course, they want to see thunder. And you can't see thunder. You can see lightning, and you can't see thunder. You hear thunder. And they're still out looking at it. See, we're, we're, I had, anybody that watches this video, the Midwesterners, when something like dangerous of, 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 of weather happens, we're the, we're the ones that get up on the roof and, where's the tornado at? <laughs> you know? Oh, was there lightning? Where was that at? One year, I got a time, I'm watching the clock. One time, we're, we're in this house where we lived, and, and they built it, go, go to scripture, I think they built it on sand. The ground was a sandy kind of ground. And there was one night, man, it was thunderstorming, lightning storming. And we had these, this French door. And so we're in this house, and there, of course we're kind of kind of freaking a little. Wow, it's a really bad storm. And I'll tell you what, we had a bolt of lightning that struck right behind the house. And, and it lit up the entire house. That's how bright it was. And of course, now I already told you about us where we get on the roof and look for tornadoes. <laughs> We're like, wow, I think it hit right outside. It, so it must be the mentality of lightning never strikes twice. Because we're like, let's go check it out. And it made a crater in the sand. And when I say sand, when you put heat on sand hard enough, it turns into glass. It had like glass little shards in the sand because it had melted that sand into glass. And I'm like, wow, it was still smoking. Man, it was like finding, trying to look for Superman after his rocket ship landed. This is just me. So anyways, <laughs> we're going to Home Depot. I'm telling you about the rain. We're going to Home Depot. And as it's raining, I go, I know we're not going to do crafts at Home Depot. So we can go in and look at the Christmas lights. And man, them kids were excited about looking at Christmas lights. Which brings me to this. Nobody likes to get in trouble. Ready? There's one of our favorite Christmas, story, Christmas shows. We watch it every Christmas on Christmas Eve. It's called A Christmas Story. It was filmed in 1983, and it runs on TBS and TNT for 24 straight hours. You can't miss it. You can always join in and watch it. Well, you can also watch it on your phone now. <laughs> and so I have watched it a couple times already these past months before coming to Christmas, and there's one part. Are you ready? Where this boy gets triple dog dare. Now, I don't know if you guys ever did this, but when you're with your buddies and you have something stupid you're about to do, you, the only way you get someone to do something stupid is to dare them. I triple dog dare you. You got to do it. And my brother did this <laughs> because we, we did not, I did not know the word triple dog dare, but I knew how to dare. And one day we were down in the basement of our house where the spare refrigerator was. And yes, it was, I dare you to put your tongue on the freezer bar. We lived in the Midwest. Let's go back to that Midwest thing. <laughs> they had 19 degrees last week and snow on Halloween. So I can easily relate to this thought process of going out in a 19 degree weather, going up to the flagpole, like in the Christmas story, and triple dog daring someone to lick the pole. Because when you put a wet tongue on something that's frozen, you will stick and you will not come off. They triple dog dared this boy named Flick, and he did it. His tongue got stuck. And the teacher's like this, where is Flick? And like I said, nobody likes to get in trouble. So they're, I don't know. They're the two boys that did the daring, uh, they never looked. And, and the way the scene goes is, oh, wow, the fire department came. And, what they, and they're standing around this boy with his tongue on the pole. Oh, wow, the cops came. And they're still standing around with this boy on the pole. And they had to do to the boy what happened to my brother. As an adult, you know this. Take warm water, pour it on the tongue, 
it'll pop off with no problem. When you're stupid and you're only probably 10 or 8, <laughs> you rip your tongue off of the freezer, just like the boy did in the movie, and blood comes out. It's just the way it happens. Why? And so there's this trouble that takes place. Why do I tell you that part of the story? <laughs> you ready? Because when Jesus asked who did it and continued to look around, a terrified woman, verse 33, a terrified, frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came fell on her knees in front of him at the feet of Jesus and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. See, I, I threw in the Christmas story because you know what? Even in times where you think you're about to be in the most trouble, the Savior is still there with compassion and understanding. And this woman, afraid of, oh wow, he's looking for me, trembling, tells the story, it was me, I did it. And in that, go in peace, your suffering is over. While, verse 35, while he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. I don't know if you have ever read this story and thought about it this way, but you know what? Those messengers, they knew about the teacher. And you're going to understand what I'm going to say. They knew about the teacher. What is it that they knew about the teacher? Because in my thought process, Jarius was in the house where his daughter was dying and his messengers were there and his family members were there and other people were there because his daughter was about to die. And in that house, even though it's not written in the book of Mark, you've got to have an understanding. The only way a messenger can have this thought process of coming up to Jarius is because in the house before they came up, Jarius had to have heard about the Savior, and Jarius told him this. I'm going to leave my daughter's dying side because there's a teacher in town who does miracles. There's a teacher in town who heals disease and sickness. I'm going to go to the teacher who has just come into town, and I'm going to bring her home to the house he had already told the messengers and the family members what he was going to do. That's why the messengers were able to come up to the crowd and find Jarius because they knew where he was going to be at. Yet, when they come up to him, they say, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. See, that's what I was saying. See, for them to, for Mark to go, this is what they said. That they said that they don't bother the teacher. That's because they were told about a teacher in the house. Can I say this? I will say this. Imagine the emotion in Jarius when he heard from the messengers that his daughter was dead. See, Sometimes we read stories in, in, in our scriptures and we go, oh, you know what? The stories are filled with emotions. How can they not? Unless Jarius is a robot, if someone comes up and tells you your loved one, the one you saw just recently lying, you were, you were by her side as she was dying, you left her side with the purpose to bring one that will heal her, and now you hear that she's dead, your emotions have got to just drop as a human being. And then if I was Jarius, hearing that, I would be angry. If that crowd was not here, constricting the Savior, if that crowd was not, because I got to him, 
let's go just the beginning of chapter 5. I got to him and asked him, and he said, yes, he would come. We were on our way, but these people stopped it. Oh, wait, even greater than that, that that woman right there stopped it too. They were messing it up, and then all of a sudden, she really messed it up. If I was Jairus, I would be so upset at the crowd and the woman taking up. Ready? I'm going to be selfish. My precious time with the Savior. See, it's not just about the feet of Jesus, though. It's about the feet of Jesus and faith. Think about it. Jairus had enough faith, enough faith, to leave his dying daughter's side to go and get the Savior. He had enough faith to tell everyone in the house, this is what I'm doing. This is who I'm going to go see. This is where I'm going. And this is why I'm going. See, don't miss all the parts. He was going to see Jesus. He was going to the place where Jesus was. And he was going to, with purpose, bring Jesus back to heal his daughter. Verse 36, Jesus overheard them and said this to Jairus. Don't be afraid. Ready? Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jairus, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing and went inside and asked, Why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She is only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and three disciples into the room where the girl was lying, holding her hand. He said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up, walked around. They were, they were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And when he told them, then he told them to give her something to eat. Pastor Mark, I'm going to ask you to come up. You know, I'm thinking, that's the end of the story. That's never the end of the story with me. <laughs> the woman with 12 years having an issue. I'm going to tell you what, I, I read scripture and it puts perspective into me because you know what, um, and I know people always ask, how am I doing, how am I doing? And, and I always think, this is what goes through my head, you know what, I, I, I met a neurosurgeon and I'm, I, he, 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 things are slow with my process, but man, that man showed me my whole problem and put a thought process into me of this and that. And, and you know, this is what he said though. He said, you know, you were born that way. And I'm like, why did it take 53 years? Man, I have worked my back over for 53 years doing, uh, um, I used to carry, ready? I used to carry 21 sets of, of uniforms for, for men and women on my shoulders and in my hands. Just, you know why? Because I got paid commission. And the more you do, the more money you make. That's just the way it is. I used to, I used to uh, uh, do heavy stuff at a hospital and walk miles every week because wa you walked every inch of it. I used to repair semi-trailers and could do everything to it. From the heavy wood you laid in the floor, the ceilings, all that stuff. Heavy, 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 heavy. And then 53, this guy, what? A woman. So in my, well, let me go. So for one year, I've been in pain in my head. Not that, that's funny, but I, this is the, I know for one year I've been in pain. This woman's been in pain for 12 years. Had a plan and touched his garment. Jesus speaks to Jairus, don't be afraid, have faith. Jairus, are you ready? Is instantly reminded, oh woman, because you have faith in what you did, your, 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 uh, your illness, your suffering is gone forever. Jairus, her faith, you be reminded of your faith. People out here, you be reminded of your faith. 
Because with that faith, results came to the woman at Jesus' feet. With that faith, um, we need to get to Jesus' feet. With that faith, you have to have this thought process. What will my faith, how, how will that catapult me into what God has for whatever it is in my life? See, for some it's an instant healing. For some it's a walk-through healing. Yeah, see, that's where it is for me up here. See, the Savior has it for me. As long as I'm at his feet, nothing else matters. Nothing. Can you get through this? Yes. You know why? Because I'm at the feet of Jesus. Can you get through that? Yes, because I'm at the feet of Jesus. Have faith. And see what results God has for them. See, so quickly, people forget the stories. They forget what it means to be at the feet of the Savior. When you, see, that's why it's so important for you to tell the stories that you tell of your life, how Jesus has done it in your life. Why do I say that? Because when he went in the house, what did they do? They laughed. Your daughter is only sleeping. These people were around there. Their faith was this. There's no breathing. There's no movement. She's dead. Jesus comes in. She's only sleeping. And they laugh at him. This is, see, nothing changes. Oh, let me tell you about my Savior, Jesus Christ. And people laugh at you. Well, that's all right. Because I have faith. Because I'm at the feet of Jesus. And guess what? That girl got up 12 years old. You can laugh all you want. You know, can I put, put it in the, this, this century right here? More than likely, she, it says she got up and walked around. Okay? If a 12-year-old girl was healed like that today, you know what she'd do? I need to check my social media. <laughs> Why is that? Because she was sleeping and just got up. There was nothing but this dramatic thing that took place with her while her dad was at the feet of Jesus. Don't let people hinder you in telling your stories. Because no matter what, if you really think about it, as we're about to sing about this song, More About Jesus, Would I Know? If you're going to sing More About Jesus, Would I Know? More About Jesus, Should I Tell also? Why is that? Because in every story, anyone that was at the feet of Jesus, anyone that was at the garment of Jesus, anyone that was in the presence of Jesus with a divine purpose, Notice what I say. A divine purpose. They had a wonderful, powerful, life-changing moment within their life. Every time. And it does not stop in this. And so my God takes me and catapults me. Why? Because I'm at the feet of Jesus. Let us stand. As we get ready to sing this song. Find yourself at a place with Jesus. God, we thank you for these moments. As we are about to sing, may our hearts be completely open to more about you. May our minds be filled with more about you. May our faith Help us to cling to the feet of Jesus. Not just because of desire, but of divine purpose that we seek in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.